everybody. Welcome to The Garage, the Court of Public Opinion. The last day of the week. Hope it's been a good week for you. And we'll sit here in the Court of Public Opinion for a few moments and we'll maybe look at some of the anniversaries of the day and birthdays and the issues of the day as well. Thump the table, shake the tree, rattle the cage. All good fun. But I do miss, Pete, I do miss the telephone. Well, we'll work on that, I think. Yeah, we'll work on it. Speaking of the telephone, March 10, 1876, the first telephone call ever in the world. And when you think about that, 1876, and these days we walk around with a mobile phone in the palm of our hand, which can tune in 15,000 radio stations. What am I saying? 200,000 radio stations could take pictures it can uh, it can uh, take memos it's your address book it's an adding machine and it was just 1876 when the very first phone call was made Alexander Graham Bell says this is the conversation somebody for posterity had the sense to record it or remember it, jot it down. Mr. Wilson, is it Wilson? No, I'm sorry, Mr. Watson, come here. I want to see you. That's what he said to his assistant, Thomas Watson, 1876. Hmm. What else can I tell you about the day? Osama bin Laden, the Islamic militant and founder of uh, Al Qaeda, born in Saudi Arabia, died 2011, but born this day in 1957. 1957. 1863, Prince of Wales, Albert Edward, he was 21, and Princess Alexandra of Denmark, she was 18, Mary at Windsor Castle in St George's Chapel. Um, 1964, Prince Edward, Prince of Britain and son of Queen Elizabeth is born in Buckingham Palace. In 1964, Simon and Garfunkel record the first version of The Sounds of Silence at Columbia Studios in New York. And there's a great story about that. Pete, did you ever hear that Simon and Garfunkel, probably back in those days, they, well, they weren't known because that wasn't the hit. And to their absolute horror, when they heard the finished product, the producers had given that sound of silence. I don't know what it is. It's echo or it's some reverb, yeah. reverb thing. And they hated it. They didn't want it to be released because their version of it was quite uh, much more folky, yeah. much more folky. That was quite a, um, a selling job the record company had to convince them that this was the version that should be released. And it was, but they did do it otherwise later on, differently. Abraham Lincoln applies for a patent, the only US president to ever apply for a patent. It was a device to lift a boat over shoals and obstacles. 1849, must have seemed like a good idea at the time. Andy Gibb, British singer, songwriter, performer, and uh, teen idol, the Bee Gees. I just want to be your everything, I think was probably his biggest hit. He dies. Um, it was myocarditis, died at the age of 30 in 1988. Chuck Norris was born. Devanchi, French fashion designer, 2018, dies at 91 years of age. Sharon Stone. <laughs> Sharon Stone. What was the movie? Basic Instinct, I think. Yes, that was the one, wasn't it? Sharon Stone. 1958 she was born, Ray Milland, um, Lost Weekend was one of his movies, I think he was also in Love Story, um, in fact he won an Academy Award in 1945 for the Lost Weekend, he dies at 81, 
1986. By the way, if, if you like to drink, uh, get a copy of or try to find a copy of Ray Milan doing the in the starring in the Lost Weekend. It'll put you off for life. <laughs> very very good movie. James Earl Ray, American assassin of Martin Luther King, was born 1928. The United States Court of Appeals rules that Thomas Edison did not invent the movie camera. Oh, we should we should be quite happy with the telephone. Quit while you're ahead. <laughs> oh, indeed. Dave Allen dies at 58 in 2005. No, I think he was 68. I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, I hope. Um, I hope, for whatever reason, you're celebrating the day. It's a, been a great day and it ain't over yet. Now, let me tell you about some of the things that caught my eye that I think we should be thinking about and talking about. There's not much doubt, in my mind anyway, that the major issue in Australia, probably a lot of other countries as well, is the cost of living. Cost of living. We need to do everything we can to take the pressure off the household budget. I mean, there are some things we can control, or at least influence, and there are other things, of course, that we can't control. The cost of food is going to be influenced by the war. That's about the only thing I can think of in terms of our cost of living that we can blame on the war between Ukraine and Russia. Russia is the world's foremost exporter of nitrogen-based fertilizers, second largest supplier of potassium, and the third largest supplier of phosphate. Its natural gas exports also underpinned a lot of European prosperity. Clearly, we can do nothing about Russia, except maybe, I don't know, send Ukraine a few more Bushmasters. That might help the day a bit. But we can, of course, cut the cost of our own electricity. I touched on this yesterday. Even if it was only temporary to placate the Greens and other flat earthers, we have to get more reliable, cheap, baseload electricity into the grid by virtue of our abundant gas and coal resources. And while seriously Australians are running around talking about and indeed closing down gas-fired and coal-fired power stations, the Chinese are opening about 180 new coal-fired power stations every year. And they wouldn't be doing that if it wasn't in their interests. But oh no, we can't do that because people in some other part of the world will think poorly of us. Really? Really? It's not rocket science, really, is it, ladies and gentlemen? It's common sense. But of course, the Greens would not let the government do it. It's all so strange. The number of houses for rent in Australia, by that, I mean affordable houses for rent for under $400 a week. Now, we still have people in Canberra who haven't done it yet, but they're threatening to do something about negative gearing. By something, I mean can it. Take away its tax advantage, its tax effectiveness, its tax attractiveness when really that is the engine room of the rental market. You know, I don't have anything negatively geared, but I know people who do, and what they do is they go out and they buy an investment property. Sometimes they buy several. They put down a deposit, and they put in a tenant, and the tenant pays off the loan. And that's their nest egg for when they retire, maybe. Or maybe it's their entire business, I don't know. But it does produce affordable, rentable accommodation. Now, if we let them stamp out negative gearing, we'll be doing the rental 
market for property a great deal of damage. We'll have more trouble than we have today, believe me. It's kind of scary, this story, the number of kids who are refusing to go to school. Now, I, I sort of knew about this. Pete? I only saw it last night. Yeah, well, when I was growing up, when I was at school, um, they told me, I remember my mother telling me years later that I had a thing called school phobia. <laughs> I don't know, you could give, they love giving things names, but I just didn't like school. Didn't like school. But these days they call them school refusers. School refusers. There's a Senate inquiry going on right now into this particular subject. Kids certainly are not enjoying school. One should try and find out why that is. After the pandemic, I guess they didn't go to school and they got out of the habit. But then again, you find a lot of people in the business world who got out of the habit of going into the office. I would also like to put into the mix, if they are looking for reasons why kids are refusing to go to school, I'd like to put into the mix that perhaps the political correctness and the fun police have taken away what little enjoyment there was in going to school. There's something going on here when you see this number of kids refusing to go to school. They're not refusing education, mind you, just school, just the school experience. It could be bullying, it could be the rules or how the rules are applied, it could be social media. I would also think it likely that there is a lack of good, interesting teachers. My God, teachers can be influential and, and very important in our lives as we grow up. You can, uh, can you remember teachers in your school days? Yeah. I remember I had a wonderful teacher called Jackie Gleason. And Jackie Gleason was an English teacher. Theatrical. But he, he brought lessons to life. And he brought life to lessons. Ah, uh, yes. And I remember my first, my first teacher. I was so in love. Oh, I can't tell you. And don't, don't tell me <laughs> kids, seven-year-olds. I didn't go to school till I was seven. But there was Miss Wilson. She was the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen in my life, apart from my mother. And I fell desperately in love with her. And I never got over Miss Wilson. Miss Wilson, where are you? <laughs> I would love to talk to her. I wanted to marry Miss Wilson. Deep down, I probably still do. <laughs> anyway, the Australian Air Safety Bureau. Uh, this story has been done. 60 Minutes, Current Affair, Front Pages. Most radio shows as well have talked about this tragic accident event with helicopters on the Gold Coast. It was a collision or I, I guess it was a collision more than a crash, but the end result was a tragedy. Apparently for some strange reason, even though it is a very busy area with these tourist helicopters, it is not regarded as controlled airspace. This is what's come out of the inquiry so far. Not regarded as controlled airspace. I think that's crazy. I'll tell you a story. The number of helicopter rides over the years that I have taken, uh, hundreds, hundreds. But particularly when I was reading the news at Channel 7, I was reading the 6 o'clock news with Graham Goodings, on seven and wills as well um, and all, there were many reasons some of them promotional but mostly news gathering reasons we had a helicopter at the back of the studios at Gilberton there was a helipad with the windsock and all of that and I think it was a it was either a helicopter that was mostly 
used by Channel 7 or owned by Channel 7. I think Christopher Scase was the guy who owned it at the time and he, he liked toys. <laughs> anyway, we would, uh, I've got vivid memories of sitting in a helicopter out the back on the pad waiting for the pilot to get clearance to take off. And the only thing you could say is that a little bit over that side there was the flight path into Adelaide Airport. But for whatever reason you couldn't take off in a helicopter without getting clearance from the Adelaide Airport Tower to tell you that there was nothing around you that was likely to become a problem. Now that that sort of regime doesn't exist up there on the Gold Coast is absolutely crazy. Crazy, crazy, crazy. I'm all for personal freedom. I think we probably all are for personal freedom. People should be able to do what they want, when they want to do it, with whom they want. But I'll leave you with this little thought. I don't know what, Pete, you think about tattoos. No, I don't like them. No, I take it you don't have any. I certainly don't have any. But I, I, I saw, and I'm continually seeing, particularly young girls covered with tattoos. And I have to ask myself, why? Why would anyone with half a brain make a decision, a non-reversible decision, to, well, I would say, disfigure herself? Men mostly sailors and bikies and pirates, soldiers, I don't know. I guess they've been doing it for years. I don't know, I don't look at them too much. But why would an attractive young woman get tattooed? I think it's beyond belief. You should never make a decision in life that will not allow you to change your mind down the track. Alternatives. Alternatives in life, I think, are probably just about as important as freedom. I don't mean to be critical. I suppose there are some people who genuinely, for cultural reasons or for I don't know what other reasons there may be, uh, they tell me it's quite painful to get a tattoo. But I saw also that the New South Wales Police Commissioner had authorised his officers, men and women, to have visible tattoos. I don't think that is the case here in South Australia. Anyway, I guess we make up our mind and I would imagine I'll get some feedback on the subject of tattoos. <laughs> Have a wonderful weekend, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for viewing the Court of Public Opinion, for supporting the Court of Public Opinion, and we'll look forward to talking to you again on Monday. I'm Jeremy Cordo. Peter Clayton is behind the camera. Believe in yourself, and goodbye for now.